Okay, I titled this Design the Difference because design makes a real big difference, especially when you apply your skills to the community. So that's my title for this. And um, we're just gonna introduce me a little bit. Yikes, okay. Uh, this is not my favorite part, but we're gonna go through it real quick. Okay, so Katie Bouchard is my name, or you can just call me Kate like Tuber does. Um, years of experience, yeah. So I guess I've been doing design since like 2007, um, professionally, like getting paid. And then unpaid, I probably started when I was like five, if I'm being honest. I used to push my furniture around before I could even move furniture because um, I really loved changing my room all the time. Like it was really annoying to my parents because they'd like come in and check on me and they'd like hit a dresser that wasn't there before. <laughs> Um, I think it started with trying to trap Santa at one point, um, and then it just turned into a hobby. Um, notable achievements, probably my most proud achievements, is that I'm a wife and a mom of three little girls, um, one, three, and five years old. And I also, on top of everything else, I just started homeschooling, which is super hard, but I actually have grown to love it. I taught my five-year-old how to read this year. So of all my achievements, that is one of the coolest things. Um, I graduated, like I said, in 2010 from the BA design program. So um, the interior design program and the industrial design program both existed at the time, but I didn't really fit in either one of those categories because I really wanted to do furniture design. And I realized pretty quickly that I wanted to take space planning and CAD and interior design. And then I also wanted to take like furniture design, but that was industrial design. So I didn't really know what to do. And um, I also learned that a lot of the students um, were struggling to graduate and that pulled at my heartstrings. And I, you'll learn this about me, but I, when things don't work and people are getting frustrated, I tend to try and find a solution. So when I talked to this one friend of mine who was, um, at Cal State Long Beach for like seven years trying to get into the interior design program and she had no degree, I asked myself, why is that a thing? And then I was so grateful to find out that they were in the development stages for the general design program that would allow students that, ne that weren't necessarily able to apply for portfolio review to have a, a place to land um, so they weren't floating anymore. And I found that to be very helpful because it allowed me to take classes all over the place. I wanted to take graphic design. I wanted to take um, typography was one of my favorite classes. And um, you'll find out later that in order for me to do what I do now, I literally used like a very holistic design background, like in order to do all of it. Like I needed my graphic design skills. I needed my furniture design skills and my space planning skills and all of the things that I pulled together from all the different classes I was allowed to take through the general program. So highly recommend that program if you yourself can't find a fit. Um, don't ever think of it as some sort of program that's like where students go when they can't graduate. Like that's how it started and that's how it was, that was why it was created. But I think designers now have taken it and run with it and made it the degree program that's customized for you and um, if you don't find yourself fitting maybe you'll fit there because that's where I landed so just wanted to say that because I remember walking down the halls and there being a lot of that like oh are you a interior design student or are you an industrial design student and I was like I'm neither <laughs> so it was a little hard and a little awkward and I didn't want anyone to feel that way like it was some sort of lesser program because it's not like it's a really great program. So if you're in that program, um, congratulations. You're in a great program. If you're not yet in that program or any other programs, you can definitely work hard enough to get into whatever program you are destined to be in. Absolutely. So don't ever give up, even if it does take you seven years. If you are determined to be an industrial designer, then level up as best you can. Okay, so industrial design is what I ended up doing. Um, after I graduated, I had a paid internship um, while I was in school, which was very odd, but I, I came across it because I was actually in a band and the keyboard player was the CFO of an interior design firm. And I had no idea because I thought he was just a surfer and in a band. Like I didn't think he really did anything to like pay his bills until I asked him one day when someone else was running late. And he said, yeah, I actually am a CFO and an accountant and all these things and I help run this company. And so um, he got my foot in the door, but I had to still interview for the job. And um, I don't know how much of this 
same story I should be sharing, Wesley, but is there people that are here from the last class that already know this story? Sorry. Just a small handful. So just, just a small a handful. So for those of you who know this story, I'm gonna try and cruise through it, but I think it's an important story because sometimes we take a class and we think an assignment isn't gonna be worth very much, um, or maybe it's the assignment that almost killed you. Um, but this assignment that I got from Tubner actually ended up being the assignment that got me my first internship. So I'm gonna share about it because I think it's important for us not to give up on, on those, those seemingly um, like insignificant assignments. Um, so I was only a sophomore when I applied for this internship, so I didn't have much to show in a portfolio. So I started pulling all together these things that I had. Like I even took pictures of my apartment because I styled it really cute and I thought that would be, you know, relevant to an interior design firm. And, um, and then I showed this picture of this lamp that I designed with Tubner. I don't remember which class that was, um, but it was like a, I don't know, rapid viz class maybe? I don't know. I don't know, Tubner, what was it? Do you remember? This is gonna be an interactive Zoom in case anyone wants to know. <laughs> How could I forget? Seriously, how could I forget? We had so much fun in that class. No, it was rendering. Rendering, rendering, obviously, because it was light and shadows and yeah. all that. Okay, so it was rendering. I don't know the number. Do you remember the number? Oh, it's no, it's probably changed. Uh, no, it might have had a different number, but it would have been the equivalent of 132A. Yeah, 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 132A. I had a class that was called that, so maybe it was the same thing. I don't know. Anyways, so the assignment was pretty simple. It was um, a lamp and I showed it to Tuma and he's like, what is the lamp made out of? And I was like, well, glass, obviously it's like reflective. And he's like, well, it doesn't look like glass. It looks like plastic. And I was like, dang it, it's plastic, it's plastic. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 make it look like glass. And then um, he was like, well, who are you selling this lamp to? And I was like, well, it's like a children's lamp. Like I could see it in a little girl's room. Little did I know that I would have three little girls later that I would probably love to have this lamp for. But um, he was like, I think you need to put something in this picture or in this rendering to help identify that, you know? And so long story short, I ended up picking, or he ended up picking a teddy bear right underneath the lamp and the light had to really um, land on that kind of texture and that kind of material. And I was not doing very well with it, guys. It took me like, I wanna say it took me like six weeks. I don't know if that was like as long as it took, but. It, I remember showing it to Tubner and him just being like, nope, not there yet. You're getting closer. Nope, not there yet. You're getting closer. Nope, not there yet. You're getting closer. Until finally the, the bear didn't look prickly anymore. He actually looked fuzzy and the lamp wasn't plastic anymore. It was glass. So um, it took a long time, but I think because I was so emotionally invested in this project, I was proud of it. I was really proud that I finally nailed the material and nailed the, the perspective and nailed the lighting and everything that was that came that was in, like encompassed in that assignment and so when I was in my interview um, later on I found this out from the woman who hired me I said Joanne you know um, why did you take a chance on me I feel like of all the candidates that came in here to be an intern why did you pick me I felt so underqualified and she said it was that teddy bear picture that that you sold me on that lamp and I thought that if you could sell me on this little lamp that you designed that you could sell anything and that's a valuable thing as a designer, you need to be able to sell your product. And so um, I said, wow, really? It was the teddy bear? <laughs> like it wasn't my awesome like apartment photos that did it um, with my records like pasted on the wall. No, it wasn't that, it was this teddy bear rendering. So I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that, um, that feeling of knowing like, wow, like I'm so glad I never gave up on that assignment. And I never, I never settled for a B or, or C. Like I really wanted to nail it. And I'm grateful to Tubner. I was so happy that he was on this call last time because it was the first time I was able to tell him that um, he basically helped me get my first internship that led to me becoming an industrial designer for seven years. And I got to design some of the coolest furniture guys for um, some really great companies. And so we went on to design for like, um, I think some of my favorite ones were like Hulu. And when they first started, they only had like nine employees and now they're like massive. Um, we designed their first workstations for all their employees, um, got to sit at the table with the people who started Hulu um, before they even had like a conference room. And, um, and just seeing companies grow from 
from just a startup to see where they are now. Being an industrial designer in commercial, commercial furniture is unique in that way because you get to come alongside these companies and see them you know, excited about their new venture, but they have this huge problem because they're going to hire employees and they need furniture and they have a budget. And so we would come in and do custom solutions that would meet their budget and their aesthetic and be super cool. Like, honestly, they went on to grow into like, I think they're making over 20 million a year now, probably. I think that's the last I heard. Um, but when I started, they were making like 5 million a year. So they're growing really, really well. And um, they're formerly Tangram Studio is the company I work for. And now they're called Studio Other. So if you want to look them up, um, their whole mantra is we make cool, like S word. <laughs> um, and I think that that's exactly what they do. They really make some cool stuff. So um, yeah, and then I had this like epiphany, I guess you could call it, when I was working in the downtown LA Hack Mutual building, that's where our first showroom, our first um, ever showroom was. We had the one that we worked in, in, in Tangram Interiors, but it wasn't like our own showroom. This was the first time that we separated from Tangram Interiors, the parent company, and we started in downtown LA and we built this beautiful showroom that showcased all of our custom furniture. And me and my mentor and my boss were so proud of this space because we used to dream up of it, like talk about how we wanted it to be really raw and have exposed brick and be in a classic building in downtown. And that's exactly what we ended up getting. And it was crazy. It was um, a famous pack mutual building, the 12th floor. It, it was the entire 12th floor. So it overlooked all of downtown. So it was awesome. I was like 24 when I got my corner office. And I couldn't believe I was even a part of that. Like, I was just like, how am I here? Like, I'm, again, I didn't feel like I was the best at anything. I just, I, get, I just kept going, you know? And I was always, I always had an attitude of, of wanting to serve and wanting to help. And so um, when we had this like wine and cheese event, we were all there at night. And at night, downtown changes a lot. Um, it happens really quickly. Even during the day, you can kind of see the the people experiencing homelessness but at night it was very very apparent um and I remember this one woman I was looking out the window kind of having a proud moment for myself and it quickly changed into not thinking about myself at all because this woman was pulling her dinner out of the trash can and I felt like I didn't want to to be a part of this industry anymore not because I didn't love it I wasn't passionate about it I just felt like my clientele needed to shift and change. I wanted my clientele to be these people. Those that are on the street looking for home, looking for hope um, because I was hungry to feed my soul at that point. I had been doing design and doing half million dollar conference tables and you know $10,000 DreamWorks workstations and like all this money just being thrown and thrown into these large corporations, which was cool. But there was something inside me um, that was hungry for impact and more and change. And um, I couldn't ignore it anymore. So like something happens to you when you're driving into downtown or wherever, and this might happen to you or where you live. I don't know where you live, but um, you might pass the same, same issue over and over again, the same problem over and over again. And you're driving and it can either irk you to the point of asking yourself the question like, hey, what would I do about this? Or you can start to ignore it and become like hardened towards it and just be like, gosh, if I were in, you know, if I was a politician, I would totally do this differently or, if, you know, or that doesn't make any sense. I would never have done that. Like we can become so jaded as designers because we do have this incredible mind to be able to solve things. And if we don't take advantage of that and turn it around and ask ourselves like, wait a minute, like what if I came up with a solution or what if? But if I asked myself, what would I do differently? You, you would be surprised what could happen. And that's basically where I was at. I didn't want to ignore it anymore. I didn't want to just hand out money to the same people at the end of the freeway ramp. I didn't want to just hand them food or make personalized little bags with socks or whatever. Like that was great and that was well-intentioned, but I wanted to see something that would actually change someone's life. Even if it was just one person, I wanted it to have a, a lasting impact, not just a temporary impact. And that's a really hard pill to swallow. <laughs> but when you're up at like the height of your career and you feel a ceiling and you're looking down at the world around you and it's, it's not getting better with you, um, it's important to ask yourselves like, 
who can I bring up here with me? Like, what can I do to, to bring that those around me? Because I don't want to be up here by myself. Um, so we're going to go back a little bit um, and break down just basically how work experience can change your mindset. Yeah. So in the beginning, as a paid intern, um, you're basically just serving everybody around you, which is such a great thing. So if you're not in an internship or you've never had one or you're looking into one, find one right away because having this level of humility is going to be important later on to mold you as a designer because you, A, you need to figure out how these things happen um, and you're not going to learn by just being handed a, you know, a business card and an office and a cubicle and being like, okay, you're a designer now, start designing things. You start by sorting like all the hardware in the cage or you start by going to installs and helping the installers install panels and figuring out what they do when a panel breaks on the truck and they problem solve and they figure it out. Um, you learn about budget and you learn about how you customize the design to, to the client. And um, there's just so much to be learned in a posture of being a sponge. And I feel like when you're an intern, you're a sponge. And the reason why I put paid intern is because you're valuable. You're very valuable. Don't settle for an internship that's not paid because it doesn't mean that they, I feel like unpaid internships can be like, they don't treat you with any respect. Like it should cost them some skin in the game in order for them to treat you with some respect. And um, if you can find a paid internship, you're going to see that level of respect. And plus you're going to show up to work on time because you know it's costing, cost, you're making money and it's costing them money. So um, look for a paid internship, do all the grunt work, don't complain, keep your head down and ask when people are stressed out, what can I do? And learn, learn from everybody, learn from the engineers, learn from the designers, learn from the fabric, like textile artists, learn from every single person around you because when you're in an internship, you haven't landed in your career yet you're literally just seeing where do you think you, you're going to fit or where do you think that you're going to be drawn to? And I was drawn to um, building the furniture and seeing like change happen. And so I was drawn to my mentor, the director of design, because I wanted to learn from her. She literally, the first time I ever met her, ran past me in a pencil skirt and a tool belt and she was holding a drill. And I was like, yes, <laughs> like she's exactly the kind of woman I want to be. And um, now I don't recommend running with a drill in your hand, especially in a pencil skirt. But if, if you ever do see me at an install, I'm very, very much like that, except I wear jeans now because it's more practical. But when you have to do presentations and install furniture the same day, that's, that was our life in the beginning of, of starting, you know, the, the growth of Kingdom Studio. And so being a part of that was eye-opening and challenging and emotional and hard but I'm so proud of that team now, being able to see where they are and knowing where they started. So you guys know, like as an industrial designer, you do get to work with all these people around you. And the whole concept is like, let's figure it out. We're gonna come up with a solution. You know, let's put our brains together. And the designer might have a great concept. Like one time I had this concept of these curved aluminum panels, like that would surround these huge workstations. Um, and they literally had to be crane lifted in through the window of a fourth story building um, because I didn't think about the fact that the entire structure had to be welded and it couldn't be dismantled because of the integrity and the strength that was needed for the panels. Um, so I was like, dang it, like, how are we gonna get this up the elevator? And the engineers laughed at me and they said, it's a fully welded piece of steel, like, or of aluminum, like there's no way it's fitting in there. We're gonna have to remove the glass from like the actual outside of the building and swing this thing in. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like what? So it costs a lot, a little extra, but luckily they were um, actually replacing some of the windows because of construction. So we found a window that it could fit through. I got really lucky on that one, but uh, yeah, like let's figure it out is the mentality that you should have as an industrial designer, as a, as a designer for anything. Like when you sit with your clients, it should feel like a team effort. Um, so that later translated into, you know, being in downtown, seeing the need and asking myself, what can I do to help solve this need? And so um, I started working remotely because I wanted to quit my job, but my boss wasn't ready and I wasn't ready. And so I worked remotely for a minute. I went to grad school for a minute, did not last. I dropped out. Um, and 
the nice thing about being in grad school was that I had a chance to take some classes that weren't design related and it was painful guys I was writing like 22 page papers about community development and um it was it was just awful I hated every minute of it um <laughs> if I'm being honest like not my favorite but again um humbling myself in a in a time where I was transitioning is very important because um, you have to posture yourself in a certain way to be able to serve those who are less fortunate. And if you come in like, oh, I'm gonna just fix everything for you. Like, I can't relate to you at all, but I have all these solutions. That's not gonna help that family or that individual at all because you have zero compassion. So um, going through humbling experiences can actually translate to better design and better um, creative process. Um, and that's what happened with Pen and Napkin. I was humbled. I was you know, interviewing um, a community director at a transitional center. And I was asking a bunch of questions like I needed to do for my paper. And that's when I discovered my need. So when I started Pen and Napkin, the mission statement was really simple and vague. It was, uh, it was creative professionals solving needs in the community. And so it was very clear to me that I, creative professional number one, needed to find a need to solve in order for this to be like our mission statement for other community professional or creative professionals to do the same thing. So I did not have a need that I wanted to solve outside of like, I want to end homelessness, but I was like, how do I end homelessness as a designer? Um, but when I started, you know, doing more research and being in grad school and asking different questions and being in different environments and actually inserting myself in the nonprofit world, talking to this community director, I asked him these questions like, you know, how does this happen? Like um, when people come to, come to your facility, what does it look like? And he's like, well, we're a transitional center. It's different than a shelter. And I'm like taking notes, transitional centers are not the same as shelters. And I was like, tell me the difference. And he's like, well, shelters are kind of like emergency, you know, shelters or housing for people that, um, just need a place to feel safe temporarily. They don't have any outside resources that are really helping them heal or anything like that or, or reunify with their children or help them with jobs necessarily, but it's a shelter for them to get them off the street or out of prison or out of a car or whatever. Um, and I was like, okay, so transitional centers have resources. And he's like, yeah, so we have a full holistic approach where if you come from a drug addiction, we're gonna put you through rehab first and guide you through that program and make sure that you have everything you need. We're gonna check in with you so you're not doing rehab by yourself. Um, and we have like two different facilities like off campus and these beautiful like cabins. And um, it's like away from the city so that people can really heal and detach. And I was like, that's really cool. And I was like, how successful is that? He's like, we have an incredibly high success rate because we are so intentional with every single person that comes in here. We're not just like corralling people through like a shelter does. Unfortunately, shelters are necessary too, but what's nice about transitional centers is they can spend more time and they can be more intentional. So I asked him more questions about that. And, and then I said, you know, like, this is such a great facility. You guys have all these apartments here. Everyone has their own furniture and um, their own space and like community table for, for food. And you guys have like a mess hall and all this stuff. And he's like, yeah, we have everything we need here. And then when they graduate and they get the keys to their apartment, they're in a really good place mentally and emotionally and spiritually that they're ready to, to embrace this home. And so um, the only thing we really need at that point, um, if we needed any design services, would be like furniture. And I was like, Ding! the light bulb went off and I lost my mind inside. I kept it cool like in the meeting because I didn't want to scare him that I had basically sacrificed the best job of all time the last year. And I was really regretting all my decisions because I thought like, what am I doing? I quit my job and now I'm running a nonprofit that doesn't exist yet. And I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so when he said that, I finally found my need. Like the need was furniture. I do furniture. Of course I can do this. And so I told him with so much confidence, it still scares me to this day. The next time you have a family graduate, I want to fully furnish and decorate their apartment. And he was like, what? are you serious? And I was like, yeah, I'm absolutely serious. I don't, I don't have the money to do that right now, but I'm going to figure it out. And you just let me know when you have a family and 
we're going to do it. We're going to fully furnish it. I'm, I'm talking beds, decor, bedding, everything. Like when they walk in, they'll have everything they had here at the shelter, but more. It'll be even personalized and, you know, you know, better suited for them. And he was like, he gave me a big hug. He was so excited. And I had no idea what I signed up for. I was just super stoked that I found a need that I felt like maybe I can do this. Um, so cut to like a literally less than a week later, I think it was five days. <clears throat> I get a phone call from a mom. Um, her name is Miss Solace. I'll never forget it. And she says, I have five kids. And um, I told you, I was told you're the furniture lady um, and that you might have furniture for me. And I like was just like, um, yeah, 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 yeah. And she's like, I'm always told that you might be able to help us with furniture. And I was like, yeah, I'm Katie. And I, um, I have a nonprofit called Pen and Napkin. Now, mind you, this pen and napkin was established, but I didn't know if we were like legit or not yet because I hadn't met with lawyers yet. We'll get to that in a minute. But I was like, okay, yeah, um, we're going to fully furnish and decorate your apartment. And she was like, oh my gosh. And she starts crying on the phone. And I was like, oh God, what did I do? Like, I have to do this now. She has five kids. The pressure's on, right? So I'm like, okay. So I get off the phone. I start getting on the horn. And the first thing I do when I committed to this was started to tell everybody, like, I needed to make sure that Penn and Hopkins, you know, affairs were in order for us to be able to accept, you know, donations in kind and actually, you know, financial. So I was working at a place called Moniker Warehouse and Moniker Warehouse is in San Diego, still is in, in San Diego, where they have these like little spots where you can like rent out space for your own business. And um, <clears throat> when we were there, um, there was this uh, law firm that was there and they were great. And I was told like, you should go talk to them. Like Wilkinson and Zayo, they're like a great law team and they can help you make sure everything's legit. So I go there and I end up bartering my design services in exchange for my bylaws and for them going through and all my paperwork to make sure that I was like legitimate. Um, because you have to be a legitimate 501c3 to get donations and all that stuff. I don't want to like embezzle money and go to prison. That does not sound fun. So um yeah I met with them I did some graphic design work for them I did like logo design and I think a little invite and some other stuff for them um and we just exchanged services and so they were like you're good to go go start fundraising and that was it I took a deep breath and I was like wow this is crazy I'm gonna start doing this and um for those of you who already know Jerome's furniture ended up getting connected with us this miracle and um, they ended up fully um, furnishing the whole place. And then my team and I and the community decorated the rest of it. And it was the first project that we ever did. And it was the most amazing experience I'd ever, ever had. And it was the, one of the hardest things I'd ever done. Um, but I was so grateful to everyone who came together. And it was the first time I saw strangers and neighbors and community leaders all come together to, to solve this need for this one family. And I was like, if people are willing to do this, like, why aren't we doing this all the time? And the whole concept for Penn and Napkin was that, okay, like once we figured out how to do this, I started building a team <clears throat> and the concept was pretty simple. Like we can assign other designers to do these projects, but it took me about 50 projects before I opened the doors to other designers. So I think it was like, I think I stopped doing actual installs at like project 85 or something like that. Um, but it took me about like 50 projects to say like, I'm getting tired and we need help. <laughs> like, and it wasn't just enough for us to have designers come and help me. I wanted them to like do their own projects. So I was like, let's find families for you. And you just do the same thing that I did. And I, I wanted our model not to expand and have all this overhead. So I didn't want it to like need a warehouse or trucks because I quickly learned that those things just collect stuff and collect dust. And when you're solving needs in the community that are so prevalent, um, stuff needs to just turn over really quickly. So we realized pretty fast, like if you can put the stuff in your own garage or rent a storage unit for like one month, then you can do a project. And a lot of these storage companies let you have the first month's free, which is great. So you end up paying like a fraction of the cost for a storage unit and you just work that into your overall campaign budget. So we were campaigning per project. We were, you know, establishing storage units across the Southland in California. 
and we were serving you know up to four families a month at one point and i was exhausted and so then 2020 hit and covid shut down how we operated because a lot of what we did required us to go online and say hey donate towards this project we're going to help this family we're going to go in their house and we're going to help them um, with furniture they need but everyone was shut down so and they also were losing their jobs and um, so we weren't we weren't able to campaign anymore and that was the first time I realized that our business model had a weak spot because <laughs> never in my life did I think we were never going to be able to campaign um, but because, you know, everything was so tumultuous at the time, like we really couldn't ask people for money. And even when we did, people would attack us for being so involved in, you know, people's personal space, I guess. But it was important for us to continue the work we did because the need actually increased dramatically um, or drastically um, when COVID hit. So um, we just took our own precautions as, as a team and we asked, you know, like, the families if it was okay for them to step outside while we did the installs or we we just we did what we could we downsized and we we took precautions but um we never slowed down in that sense um we ended up getting the biggest grant that we ever received from a personal friend of mine um that sustained us all through 2020 and at the point of 2020 i really wanted to quit i had done so many installs i was like i'm done there's no money there's no way I can keep doing this. They're shutting us down left and right. We're getting backlash from everyone. Um, and we're just trying to help. Like maybe that's it. You know, I, you know, I was, I just had my third kid. <laughs> I was like, I've been doing all these projects pregnant at some point. Um, and so I, I thought I was done. I thought, you know, I did, I did my thing. I tried. And Corey, what does the dog want? He keeps looking at me. Sorry. <laughs> Pause for my dog for a second. Um, and so I, I quickly realized like, you know, this could be the end. And um, that's when I had one last, um, what do they call it? Hail Mary. I sent out one email and that was to my friend who owned this company called California Beach Co. He recently was acquisitioned and made a ton of money off of it, which I'm so proud of him. But I emailed him and I said, hey man, I know things are tough right now for everybody, but is there any way you guys can make your quarterly donation because we are, we're tapped out and I don't want to say no to these families. And within like 30 seconds, he responded with, here's $20,000, go make change happen. And I was like, I just sat there like, I really wanted to quit. <laughs> like, I actually was like, kind of like, oh man, I want to freak out right now. But at the same time, like I have to keep going. Like clearly I have to keep going, you know, I can't give up now. And so that was the second like light bulb experience that I had because after years of doing that and um, all of the work that we did, um, I was ready to let go, but that's not what God wanted for me or my family. And so we said yes to the $20,000. We kept going. And that's when we started asking designers all over the place to say, hey, can you help us out? Because we can't do this on our own. Um, so I'm going to go to the next page. The first designer... Uh, we kind of already went all through this. Um, sorry, I should have changed over already. So yeah, we went over all that. Um, other than like, it's like 290 designers now, um, four different countries, US, UK, Australia, and South America, which is really cool. Um, and then we have these training classes that I'll, I can tell you guys about later. But basically the first training class is you just sign up and say, hey, I'm interested in learning how to cut a napkin. And that whole class goes through what Pin and Napkin does, why we do it. And then the 201 class, um, you present the needs in your community, and then we choose one with you. And um, then we come up with the campaign, the budget, and everything, and you build a team, and you start that install, like you start the process of it. So we had 30 designers in our last 101 class. They're all graduating into the 201 class, and now we are going to have 30 more in the first 101 class and have 200 or sorry two 201 full with another 30 students so um yeah we're really excited because we're starting to multiply um our our impact which is cool um okay so the first designer was actually from the monica warehouse that i told you about in san diego that i worked at she um she was the first to be like hey can i do a project and i was like what do you mean like yeah absolutely like and she's like, you don't have to be involved. Like, we totally can do it. And I was like, wait, really? <laughs> like, okay. 
like this is a new thing for me like what do you need my help with and she's like honestly just a family if you could just assign us a family or find a need we want to do a project just like you've been doing we've been watching you it's really cool we want to do it so i found um you know a family for them and they did everything literally did their own campaigning did their own fundraising pulled money from their own resources because they're you know their own design firm and MSWAB was the first um, design firm to say yes to a pen napkin project. And they were featured in San Diego um, Magazine, which is like their, I don't know, they were featured in like three different magazines actually because of this project, which is great. It was really exciting for them. Um, and then we had our first celebrity designer, Emily Henderson. So some of you guys might know Emily Henderson. She's been a long time. She's been around a long time as far as in the design world. And she started out as an HGV, HGTV personality. <clears throat> and uh, we worked with her because we were doing like a, like a fundraiser. Well, she was doing like a rummage sale and she wanted the rummage sale to benefit a charity. And I was living in Glendale, California at the time and she was in Los Feliz at the time. And so she wanted to find a local charity and I fit the bill. So I DM'd her on Instagram. I said, hey, how about us? We could totally use some help with fundraising. And we became friends and she's now on the board of directors and has been a huge part in the growth and success and expansion of Pen and Afghan. Um, so they were, they did their first feel good flash makeover, which was really neat. Okay. Can you see it now? Feel good flash makeover. Okay. So we've teamed up with Pen and Napkin. Yes. yes. And is a single yes. mom with three kids and one on the way. She's gonna have a baby in a couple weeks. And they wanted to remain anonymous because they were transitioning out of homelessness and they literally Katie, I lost the sound. I'm not hearing the sound for some reason. They literally don't have a sofa to sit off, so they didn't really use that room at all. And then go. in the dining room and kitchen, it's really important to mom to have dinner with the family every single night. And so we, we need to give them a dining table and chairs. So we have two days, and my entire team is pitching in to turn this apartment into a really comfortable home for this family inside. First, we take everything out, and then we start loading everything, building the beds, hanging the wallpaper and the curtains, and really transforming the space. Next, we go room by room and style it out with all the finishing touches. Katie from Pen and Napkin stopped by for a little surprise visit. I take this moment seriously to just pop and be like, wow, we get to be a part of the solution. And the answer to prayer for a woman who literally was just sitting by herself in her car, holding a picture of her baby, praying that there would be a solution. And you guys are that solution. So, come on, guys. <laughs> And after a lot of hard, but fun work, we're ready for the family to move into the new space. All right, this is the girls' room, and they love pink and purple and sparkles and glitter. Um, so it was designed to to kind of have that excitement. Um, so we started with this mural on the back. It's from Minted, and it's actually it's self adhesive, so it's pretty easy to put up. And then the bunk bed, simple, white, and actually very affordable. It's on the wall, so go check it out if you're interested. And then since they like pink and purple so much, we brought some pink and purple in, and a lot of like little fun assets. This room created the most challenges because it's pretty small, but it needs to house three people. So uh, Belinda from the design team came up with a really good solution of doing a twin over full bunk bed, but it's kind of special. So back here, there is a DIY headboard that she created just to make it feel almost more like a day bed. So the mom and new baby that's coming in a couple weeks will be sleeping down here, and then her 13-year-old son will sleep up here. And what's great and smart about this is that we put it on a curtain, so at least she has some privacy because he's a 13-year-old boy. But the room, while it did get smaller in a way, now can actually sleep with everybody in a way that is far more comfortable. So there was no dining room, there's nowhere to eat, um, but it's really, really tight, so coming up with a solution that actually worked was was tricky. Um, but this one has storage here, and um, and it is big enough that they can all sit and have dinner, but there's still really good flow around it. This room was empty, guys. There was nothing in here. They didn't even use it because they had nowhere to sit. Um, so the, the focus was really on color and comfort with by adding some storage elements as well. Um, the sofa is actually a twin bed. So if um, her son wanted to sleep out here, he could because it's really comfortable. But we just tried to make it a really cohesive, happy, like home full of comfort for them. 
Even though the family wanted to remain anonymous, I can promise you that they were thrilled. So we pulled up another feel-good flash makeover thanks to the EHD team, and hopefully this space makes the family feel really safe and cozy for a long, long time. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye. Okay, so that's Emily Henderson, you guys. Uh, incredible woman. If you don't already follow her on Instagram, you should. She's just a great person and a great designer. Um, so then we had our first install out of state. And this designer, if you can see all the collection of donations she received, all of the donations were sent in by her followers on Instagram. Every single one of them. So, or they were sponsors from one of our partners like Casper or Tuck and Needle or... I feel like Society6 was one of our sponsors at the time. And it was incredible because this was the first time that in our, in our kind of evolution that we realized that people can buy things online <laughs> and send them anywhere. And so you can have someone in Texas buy something for someone in Oregon and it's, they still get to be involved and still get to make a difference. Um, and a, a lot of people actually preferred to buy things from an Amazon wish list because Let's say you like see the lamp that's on the wish list, and then you buy that lamp and you send it to the to the designer, and then she puts it in the family home. And then during the reveal, you see that lamp in the background, and you're like, "I bought that lamp." That's a really cool feeling because you're not just donating money at that point; you're getting to see the actual item you're purchasing in a home. So a little different experience there, and it really opened up our eyes to the, the possibilities that we're um, presenting ourselves with with Instagram and with Facebook and just social media in general, being able to to reach beyond our walls and beyond, you know, California. So um, she broke down that, that state line and um, did the first out-of-state project. After that, we had a, a designer in New York do a project, a designer in Minneapolis do a project. And now we have, like I said earlier, we have designers that are um, signed up in 40, 48 states now. It's really crazy. Um, so hopefully we'll start to see all these projects pop up all over um, the nation and then some outside of you know the US, which is cool. Um, so I actually do have her video. We have time, it'll actually have the family's reaction, which I think is fun. Are you guys down for one more video? Yes. Oh yeah, okay. absolutely. Also, you should know this, she is not an interior designer per se. She's a muralist, she's an artist, she's a painter. And she said yes to this project because she felt like she could do it. And um, she was really excited to involve her followers in this project and um, she designed it with them too. Um, so you'll see that this is an apartment and she did wallpaper, but she also did a mural on this um, paintable wallpaper. So she did a wallpaper strip and then she painted her signature stripes that she has like in all her posts, you'll see her. If you follow Banyan Bridges on Instagram, you can see all her murals, um, but her name is Rachel Jackson. So um, let's do this one. Um, can you guys see sound? Or see sound? See and hear sound? Yep. Oh, 
She was looking at the Amazon notes that the people wrote little personal notes to her, which was cool. I know, I don't know. I think love it. I'm like, that is That's killer. Oh, and that just chooses. Oh, and it's like fresh, clean, and ready for you. Oh, it's great. Gosh, doesn't that just make it nice, though? That's so nice. Oh, my gosh. It's so soft. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. All right, so that was the second video I wanted to show you guys. Um, um, let's see. Okay, alrighty. So um, let's see. Justina Blakely was another designer that we had come on board. Um, can you guys still hear me? Everything good? Anytime I transition, I want to check because make sure. Um, her okay. stuff is actually her stuff is actually in Target right now. You can buy Justina and Jungle's stuff. Um, so having her come on board was really neat because um, she was one of Emily's friends, and um, and she was like another celebrity designer that was like, "Hey, if Emily did it, so can I," you know, type thing. Kind of similar to like the designer friends that I had were like, "If you can do it, I can do it." Um, so it was cool to see it happen on both levels, no matter like how. Um, you know how relevant you are to the design community these this desire to help and see change is within all of us as designers um and so to see justina respond so generously that was super cool and then now she's like featured in target so i get to be reminded of her generosity every time i go shopping which is really neat um and then more importantly than any designer we've ever had i value my student designers because I think it's really neat when we have students from um, all over reach out and say, hey, I'm super busy with school, but I want to do a project. And I say, okay, you're going to run a project. And they're like, no, 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 I just want to volunteer. And I'm like, no, that's cool too. You can volunteer and you should volunteer before you run your own project. So Cynthia had volunteered for about a year as my intern, as my personal intern for Pet and Napkin. And she told me, I'm really interested in going to to design school, do you think I could do it? And I'm like, absolutely. I mean, you're such a great designer. You have a great eye. And I've always been one to encourage students. Um, and she applied for the San Francisco State Interior Design Program. She got in. And I've been able to watch her on this journey from the very beginning. Um, and she's graduating this year. She has a job at a design firm in Glendale. And the way she got her job was because of all her hours and her experience with Pet and Napkin. We were able to bring her on staff last year. Um, or a year and a half ago, she was on payroll for Pet and Napkin as a, as a designer, um, but she put in countless hours of volunteer work and built a portfolio that was so impressive. I mean, she did probably 12, 15 projects, um, and she's super young and just graduating college now, and I'm just so proud of her because not only is she super humble and super talented, to, but together the, those things combined are like you know, unstoppable, but she, she like, truly cares about the people that she serves now and that she, you know, helps. Um, she's designing the a Burbank Hotel with her boss, and I think there's only one other designer, so it's a team of three, and they're working on this um, huge remodel in Burbank, and it's so exciting for her, and she thought she would never get to work at a design firm that was so prestigious and all these things, and she's put in the effort and put in the work, so um, she has her own little Instagram account or not little Instagram account, but like little design company, I guess, um, called Lighthouse Interiors. She just started and then she's working as a junior designer now. So um, I bring her up because she's one of my closest, like dearest friends slash interns slash, you know, now she's like worked for me. She even works for Inkplot sometimes as a freelance designer. But when she started, she had no idea what she wanted to do um and she wasn't even in college yet she just wanted to help and she was attracted to pen and napkin and and she came on board and just did the grunt work like just like i said like the grunt work in the beginning is some of the hardest work you'll do but it will shape you and shape your character and i need to take a drink i'm sorry i'm getting tired um okay so that's cynthia vina she's amazing 
and um, I'm super grateful for her. She just finished last week the um, <clears throat> the first install we did for a um, a safe house for women who have been um, trafficked into se the sex trade industry. And these women have left the industry or have been rescued and are now um, like basically starting over and trying to, to heal. Um, there's a lot of trauma involved in that industry. Um, and it, there's just so much that they go through um, and just being trafficked in general is awful. So we wanted to create a space in this home that was bright and airy and happy and joyful. And um, we ended up fully furnishing and decorating the entire house, all four bedrooms. We weren't able to shoot a reveal, obviously, because these women are in, in um, protective like housing. So um, it has to be anonymous, but um, I am able to show you this one picture of the interior that Cynthia did of the, um, the living room and her and the team and the volunteers that she put together did a fantastic job capturing exactly what the founder wanted. Um, the founder herself was also trafficked and that's why she started Cherished LA. Um, you guys can look up Cherished LA if you're interested in, in um, checking that out, but they're local to Los Angeles and they essentially like help these women start over. And um, she herself was actually, I'm just gonna be a little graphic here. So if you have kids listening, um, please close it. She herself was sold um, for an eight ball of cocaine by her best friend and her life was flipped upside down. Um, and it was one of the most tragic things that ever happened to her. But if you talk to her now, she's so proud of all the things she's been able to accomplish by helping other women transition out of the industry and back into society because no one really helped her do that. She did that on her own and um, was strong enough to do that on her own. And um, yeah, so we are helping them on another house coming up in four weeks. It'll be the second house. So this house was, it had to be done and ready and prepared for um, the women that are gonna be uh, rescued from, I hate to say it, the Super Bowl because during the Super Bowl, it's one of the highest times of trafficking. Um, and so women and children will be rescued with an incredible task force. Um, and it's, it's just gonna reach across all of California really because um, traffickers have gotten really smart. And so they don't do it like right around the, the Super Bowl anymore. So there's task forces um, all up and down the coast and we're part of the one for Los Angeles County and Cherished LA is gonna be housing 15 women um, that will come from that um, rescue. So this house had to be ready in time for that. And the work that is Cynthia and her, her team did to pull this off in such a short amount of time was really remarkable. Um, so we're really grateful that we had time to paint all the walls we do all the carpet and fully furnished and decorated. Um, so um, the next house is gonna be the house that's existing that some women are already living in right now. And we're just gonna spruce it up a little bit and um, freshen it up so that they don't feel like we got the lesser house or anything like that. We want both houses to be equally amazing and um, beautiful and um, reflect back the dignity and the, and the hope that they need to really feel restored. Um, so, why do I do pen and napkin is probably one of the, like the most obvious questions I get all the time. And it's this face right here. This is one of the faces, the first faces that I ever saw during a pen and napkin project. Um, I didn't realize that design could change lives until I did my first project and I witnessed it firsthand. It's one thing to watch these movies and these videos and get a little emotional maybe, or maybe it doesn't really do anything for you. But when you're there in person, it changes you forever. And this isn't just about serving these families and making a difference in their lives. It's about making a difference in your own and making sure that as a designer that you own the responsibility of the gifts that you've been given. And the gift is that you're never satisfied until something is solved. If there's a problem around you, eh, there's a solution. And we have to come to terms with the fact that we are in a constant state of revisions, kind of like my, my project with Tupper. It was in a constant state of revisions. Embrace that. The moment you can learn to embrace that, you'll, start be, you'll stop beating yourself up as a designer and you'll actually allow yourself to grow into the designer that you are and that you can be. Um, allow yourself to ask hard questions like, why does that work that way? 
why is there a better way that that can work and function? Um, I was doing some research before this and I didn't know if I was gonna talk about this, but I thought it was kind of funny. And I thought maybe people would think it was weird that I mentioned that, you know, some of my greatest accomplishments is being a mom. Um, but being a mom has shaped me as a designer as well. Not just all these life experiences that I've had, um, you know, in my childhood and everything else, but like being a mom has actually impacted my, my design view. And I found out that a lot of things that we use every day were designed by moms. Like the dishwasher was <laughs> designed by a mom and engineered by a mom. Like the trash can with the foot pedal was designed by the mom who's famous for being like the mom that was inspired the movie Trooper by the Dozen because she had 12 kids. And did you know that she was an industrial engineer and a, tra a trained psychiatrist or say, trained psychologist? And that was like, that makes sense that she was both those things. She would be able to like raise 12 kids. And then, um, I don't know, there's like all these other designs that I found out that were designed by moms. And I just thought that that was so neat because that's what happens. Like design comes out of inspiration or, or absolute necessity. And we've all heard the phrase, you know, practice makes perfect. But we also know that, um, that that's not true. Like, because as designers, there's no such thing as perfection to us. Like there's always gonna be something wrong with it. Even when we think it's perfect, it, it really isn't and we're not satisfied and that feeling of being dissatisfied is what makes you a designer and so it's actually a really beautiful thing so learn to embrace that because practice should just make improvement that's it like constant improvement improving yourself improving those around you improving the environments around you um so my challenge for today for you guys was to ask yourself what irks you like when you drive through your community when you get into your home, like what are the things that bother you that you feel like you could change and you could, you could, you know, um, ask, like start to figure out like what it is that you could do to, to take a little responsibility for that and change it yourself because no one else is going to do it. And I feel like if we all took a little responsibility for our communities, then maybe that we would start to see some change that we really, really need to see. And um, all I did was say yes to one family. And now we have the potential to serve like thousands across the nation. And it was a very hard step, but I would, I would, never, I would never regret it because it's led to the growth of Penn and Afghan. And I'm so proud of where we are now. And I'm so proud of um, all the designers that have come on board to help us. Um, so ask yourself, what's your Penn and Afghan moment? Where's the moment where you see a problem and you wanna write down a solution. For me, it's always around food, which is why pen and napkin is a napkin, not paper. And then they're like, why is it not pen and paper? I was like, because I always am inspired by food. I don't know why, like there's never a paper around. It's always a napkin. <laughs> um, so what is that thing that you wanna start figuring out? Um, ask yourself these hard questions and, and start taking responsibility for some of the needs in your community. And let's just see what happens, you guys. I'm just so honored to be here, like I said, and if um, we can start doing questions, I'd really love that. And then maybe we can watch the other video I sent to you guys from the actual Penn and Apple website if we have time. What do you guys think? <laughs>